I noticed just the other day you were banned from Twitter. Now, you know, I'm somebody, nobody can argue against my lefty credentials. Everybody knows um, I'm a man of the left. Having said that, my, my solution on this issue of social media censorship has always been, look, we need to expand First Amendment protections. And the way you do that is to regulate these big social media companies like their public utilities. So if you do that, then you, you know, basically you're saying this is the new public square and people can speak their mind here. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you can't, you know, dox people or do direct threats of violence or anything like anything that's actually illegal will remain illegal. But outside of that, you can't censor people just based on um, political opinion. So, you know, I definitely wouldn't have banned you, suspended you, et cetera. But I do have a question about that specific tweet that did get you in trouble because, you know, you said something to the effect of. Um, well, I don't know if it got me in trouble. You know, I don't think I'm in trouble. Twitter banned me, but I don't consider well, that trouble. That's <laughs> fair enough. Fair point. Um, but you said something to the effect of remember when pride was a sin and um, mm -hmm. uh, the criminal physician. And Ellen Page just had her breasts cut off by a criminal physician. Criminal physician, exactly. So my question is is the physician really criminal? If you agree that adults can decide to transition, then why would the physician be criminal? Don't adults have that right if they want to transition? Not everything legal isn't criminal. And do they have that right? See, I would have left Ellen Page alone if she hadn't been parading her new abs in a fashion magazine. How many kids do you think she can convince to convert? A one? Yeah. Thousand? No, not. See, yeah. I, no, no. Really? I want to. I want to respond to that. I yeah. think that with the trans community, it's very similar to the gay community, where back when that first became a big issue, people thought, oh, if we talk about it, if it's in magazines or whatever, we're promoting kids to go down that path. But really what happened is people are who they are. That, and if that they're is gay, they just decided to be no. like, yeah, I'm gay. And they were just more open and honest with themselves. So I don't think you're promoting people to do that. No, that's you're just not saying, what happened. If you they're are that, it's OK. Wrong. OK, well, you're I'm, utterly I'm, I'm wrong. listening. There's I'm nothing listening. about that that's right. So I explain well, there's been an absolute look. One of the reasons that I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin with, this pronoun compelled speech bill, was because I knew perfectly well what was going to happen when we introduced confusion about gender identity into the public sphere. Now, the argument was that if we left people with gender dysphoria alone to make their own way and stop torturing them, that we would decrease the mental health load on those individuals. And my analysis as a clinician was that for every one person of that sort that we hypothetically saved, we doom a thousand more as a consequence of confusion and social contagion. I knew the literature on psychogenic epidemics. They used to call that mass hysteria. And it's a literature that goes back about 300 years. And whenever you introduce Often when you introduce social confusion, you can produce a psychogenic epidemic, especially among, generally it's adolescent females who are most susceptible to it. So I thought, oh, well, what's going to happen is we'll produce a psychogenic epidemic of gender dysphoria among adolescent females. And that is exactly what's happened. And it isn't the fact that we've freed up people who are, what, in doubt about their identity to be who they are. That may have happened in a tiny minority of cases. It's absolutely and definitely the case that we've doomed thousands of kids to brutal, mutilating surgery and premature sterility. And we've done that on the altar of our hypothetical moral virtue and compassion. Look, I read a corporate analysis of the trans surgery industry last week. Growth rate projection for you lefty types and your anti-corporatism. Growth rate projection. 15% per year, invest now at $350 million business as of 2022, projected to expand to 750 million by 2027. No moral hazard there. There's so plenty of moral hazard what, there. What and that surgery is absolutely brutal. So what percentage of the population do you think, uh, in your conception of how this is unfolding, what percentage of the population do you think is going to end up being trans at the end of this. Do you think like oh, one day it's going to be like seventy percent of the we know country is trans? That, well, we know already that about one in five adolescents. Now, 
identifies, to use that hated word, identifies as part of the hypothetical LGBTQ plus community. So it's one in five. I don't know what the upper limit is. There's a consulting group in the UK now that's claiming there's 150 different genders. There's actually, I suppose, 7 billion different genders if you want to get technical about it because everybody's temperament differs. But I don't know what the upper limit is. And I have no idea what the upper doesn't limit is for this surgical intervention. We'll see. Doesn't but that I, don't find it, I, I don't find it the least bit acceptable. And if you think that your compassion is demanding that you extend your uh, pity to the LGBTQ plus community at the cost of sterilizing children, you should think again. You're on the wrong side of this and not Wait, in a trivial on. way. Don't. I, I, I would appreciate if you don't ascribe beliefs to me that I don't have. Remember, my original question was well, about- Well, you said earlier in well, this I said, question- that, I said, that you Elliot were, Page is an adult, and so do you think that he has the right to yeah, transition? But the, that was the original question. You made question. some comments after that. Yeah, but as a star mm -hmm. and a public figure and a model for emulation, mm -hmm. she also has the responsibility not to entice confused adolescents into a catastrophic decision before they have the maturity to make that decision. I just have to say, Jordan, I think it's a little bit of a moral panic. I just don't see some sort of, you know, frenzy of okay, what people would you wanting consider, to become trans. What, first of all, that's a hell of a way to put it. What, is, Why don't you that? take a look at the increase in, in surgical interventions and see what you think? I mean, how many do you think well, is too many? How again, many wait, look, the, if we're talking about I'll, I'll suffering, answer your question, I'll answer your question. The argument is, it. It used to be very repressed because that's very outside of the tradition and the norm and the standard. And that now we sort of let the be, boot off the neck a little bit. Suppressed? What used to be suppressed? All the, exactly. as the entire LGBTQ community. I mean, it was very recently we okay, even first got of gay all, marriage not in the United States. First of all, they're not a community. Well, you understand what is the point this I'm community? making. No, I'm no, actually, neither I understand it nor you. And that's why we're delving into it. <laughs> first of all, they're not a community. That's just a catchphrase. It's a buzzword. And I'll tell you something else, that almost all the kids who are undergoing surgical intervention, the clinical literature is absolutely clear on this. 80% of kids with gender dysphoria identify as homosexual when they mature. 80%. And that means the vast majority of people who are being converted surgically are gay. Now, how is that an advantage to the gay community precisely? No, see, I'm not I'm not taking a position in any way, shape or form on the kids because I don't know the well, first you thing about this to comment on the kids. Well, but see, that's why we're having this conversation, though, is because my original question was about kids. the adults and what your take is on the adults. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like let me ask you, this, would you ban transition surgery for adults? I don't know. Really? Yeah, really. See, We're paying a big price for it. And I well, think that I think that it was um, it was an, an act of stunning hubris to conduct the first trans surgery procedure. But, and it's not obvious to me at all that it's been a net social good. And but so aren't there some people that are obviously trans who were born in one body, they feel like they're in the other body. And when they're an adult, they can make the decision. And then even from just a freedom and liberty perspective, shouldn't they have that right? Even if they do it and then they regret it, shouldn't they have the right to try it? It's a good question. I mean, it's a tricky one, right? Because there's all sorts of surgical enhancement procedures that are obviously, it's not obviously appropriate to make them illegal. And I don't know exactly where the cutoff line is, so to speak. And that's partly why we're having a public discussion about it. But uh, this, this, this entire argument in many ways is stated so idiotically that it almost defies description. I mean, what do you mean feel like you're in the wrong body. Well, what kind of measurement is that? Now, hang on a sec. I was gonna there are probably. rules <laughs> for these sorts of diagnostic decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rule is that you have to make a valid and reliable diagnosis. That's if you're diagnosing depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or cancer or anything like that. There are standards that you have to abide by mm. in order to make a diagnosis, in order to fulfill the obligations of your professional college. If someone comes to you and says, I feel like I have lung cancer, that is not sufficient grounds upon which to formulate a diagnosis, much less proceed to surgery. 
Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what do you mean by feel? What is that? Is that an emotion? Is it a motivation? Is it a philosophical conclusion? What is it? Let me, let me explain. Feeling. Let me explain to you what I mean. Let me explain to you what I mean. So I've been doing my show for about a decade, and about mm-hmm. two or three years into doing my show, there were you know some stories here and there that I covered about the trans issue. Somebody who is trans reached out to me and explained to me in a very straightforward way. Yeah, look, I was born biologically female. I feel like I'm biologically male. My reality what does never that mean? lined up. Well, feel. Me, I'm just explaining what they said, and then you can respond however you'd like to respond. And they told me as soon as I got the surgery, changed the way I dressed, changed the way I appeared. I felt phenomenally better. And so that's why, at least for me, this was the answer. Now, I think it would be incredibly arrogant for me to say back to that person, no, you shouldn't do that, or I know better than you do for yourself. Now, that's not to say that every time somebody does this, it works out well, of course, because everybody's an individual. But in some instances, that's the answer. So, you know, me as Mm -hmm. a simple outsider, I just look at it and say, hey, whatever floats your boat, and if it works, it works. Look, most of the time, my attitude is you can go to hell in handbasket any way you choose if you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, this problem is complicated and compounded by the fact of the necessity of medical involvement and the ethics on the medical front. So when you asked me about how that should be regulated, my answer was, I'm not exactly sure about that. Yeah, Although it isn't obvious to me that the, that, It's obvious to me that the trans surgery enterprise has gone way too far, way too far, thousands of people too far. And I'm certain that it's harmed exponentially more people than it's helped. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.